The media's role in modern American politics is that of investigator, arbitrator, and even kingmaker. Today's guest argues that contrary to popular belief, media bias is not about left and right, but about positive and negative. He's Thomas Patterson this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvey Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Every week we try to make sense of the narratives, the stories that shape our understanding of public life in the United States. Helping us this week is a tremendous scholar of American media and politics, Thomas E. Patterson of the Kennedy School at Harvard. Tom, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you, Jim. So you're the author of a new study from the Shorenstein Center at Harvard uh, that looks at media bias and the coverage of President Trump, particularly in his first 100 days. What did you find? Well, it's less a study of, of bias than it is a study of um how much coverage Trump received from the news media. Uh, and, uh, you know, presidents ordinarily dominate the news, and that's been the case ever since television came along. Before television, uh, news coverage actually was pretty evenly balanced between Congress and the executive branch. Uh, but for television, of course, the presidency uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, it's a national medium, national audience. Uh, it's much easier to portray in pictures a person than a building. Uh, and so ordinarily the presidency is the center of attention, but uh, our study found that no one has received the kind of attention that Donald Trump did during his first 100 days. So normally a president can expect to get about an eighth of the national news coverage. Uh, he got over 40% of the national news coverage during those first 100 days. Any, any explanation why? Well, I think there are two. Um, first of all, he's a good story. I mean, so, you know, journalists, when they look out at the world, they look for what's unusual. They often look for controversy, conflict. That's, those are the makings of a good story. Um, and in some ways, you know, Donald Trump is a walking story. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know. <laughs> That's a good description. You know, almost, you know, almost every day he says or does something uh, that, that's a candidate for a top story. Uh, so he, he fits journalists' needs very well. Uh, and then the other reason uh, is that uh, shortly after he announced for the presidency in June of, of 2015, uh, about two weeks in, it was pretty clear that audiences were attracted to Donald Trump. So not only was he a magnet for journalists, but he was a magnet for audiences. And uh, you put Donald Trump on the air uh, and your ratings go up. And uh, you know, and, and that has a subtle effect, I think, in, in terms of kind of how people think about uh, what to cover. Um, and if you look, for example, at the cable uh, networks right now and compare them where they were two years ago in terms of their audiences, uh, all three of them, MSNBC, CNN, and Fox, are up about 50% in their ratings. And uh, that's largely... That's, that revenue. That, that, that's Trump, uh, because up until that point, they were going in the other direction. And... Uh, their ratings were slipping. So it's really hard to see anything else in the last two years that has brought people to the television sets and to pick up the newspaper uh, as much as Donald Trump has. So we want, to talk, we want to talk a little bit more about the study, but I want to pick up on something here. Is, 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 do you think that this is part of a strategy then? Is, is, is Donald Trump's ability to make his own media, uh, forget about tweets for a second, but just his own ability to dominate the media coverage, is, it, is this just... Uh, a, a luck or a unique characteristic, or is this actually part of a political strategy by this White House? No, I think this is Donald Trump. I mean, I, I, I think the White House has tried, if anything, to kind of rein him in a bit and uh, to have him show more message discipline and uh, not only around the tweets, but about some of the other statements uh, that he's made. I mean, he, he recently had a trip to Europe, uh, met with uh, the na leader leaders of NATO, uh, in the speech was a commitment to an article of the NATO 
compact uh, that guarantees that if an attack on any member is an attack on all. And uh, <clears throat> at the last moment, he, he pulled that out of the speech. Right. Uh, and he did that personally. And uh, against the suggestions and the advice of his advisors. And of course, that's a story, right? Uh, so if he'd have gone and simply said what was expected to say, right? The fact he didn't say it became a story. So I think by his own instincts and by his own actions, uh, that's where most of these stories are coming from. And uh, if it was a strategy, uh, it's not a very good strategy because at least half the time, this is not serving you know, his goals. So that, um, you know, uh, and so I think there's, it's less a, a sign of a strategy than a lack of discipline on the part of the president. This, of course, is a two-way street between media outlets in the audience and readers or viewers. You used to term magnet for audiences to describe Donald Trump. And I think that's a very good term. Talk a little bit more about what you mean by a magnet. What about him appealed or attracted or became the magnet for people on both sides of the political spectrum? It wasn't simply Trump supporters. It was people who don't like Trump. And that remains to be the case, or it remains the case. Well, I, I, I th you know, I think there's a, a long explanation to that, and I'll try to give you a short version of it. Um, you know, if you think about what it takes to become president of the United States, uh, you know, there's a traditional path, and I think Hillary Clinton's a very good example of a traditional candidate. Uh, and that candidate spends time in government uh, and uh, sort of builds the, the list of followers and, and, and uh, financial supporters that you need to mount a campaign. Uh, Donald Trump comes into the arena, and he begins to kind of hit the button on these hot button issues, uh, on immigration, uh, on terrorism, uh, on abortion, right down the list, right? And, uh, and those hot button, hot button issues traditionally draw a crowd. I mean, that you know, they, we may say there's too much conflict and not enough cooperation in politics, but you know, everybody likes a fight. And uh, you know, conflict's a bigger draw uh, than cooperation. And, uh, you know, and that's been his game from the minute he got into the presidential arena. I mean, that, uh, you know, some politicians get in and they try to bring people together, try to heal divisions, uh, and they try to put together a, a coalition in that way. And others, and Donald Trump is not the first by any means, uh, do it through a process of division. And, uh, and that's been his strategy pretty much from the beginning. And uh, there's more draw to that, uh, to that kind of politics than there is to the more placid type of uh, politics that, that, that some politicians pursue. So you've, you've written about the, uh, the really sort of positive coverage that Trump received when he, when he announced. I don't know if positive is the right word, but it was sort of a, a, kid's, a kid's glove approach. There was not this sort of deep, sort of questioning of, of, of both his policy expertise and all of the sort of negativity that we've seen since the inauguration. And that has really sort of switched at some point around the time of the Republican convention. Um, is, is, was, was the switch in the media's coverage of candidate Trump and now President Trump to be expected? Well, I should say switch in the tone. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look, go back and look at, and this, there have been studies that have been done since the mid 80s of, uh, presidential nominees, and um, there's one nominee in that whole period of time that on balance received positive rather than negative coverage, and that was Barack Obama in 2008. So the normal mode for the press during the campaign is to be a critic of the candidates, and so they get mostly negative coverage. And of course, they're also in the crosshairs, so other people are criticizing them as well, right? And uh, you know, and, and journalists are more likely to tell the story of a candidate attacking another candidate than a candidate giving the same speech for the 10th time uh, on the economy. So, you know, there's a dynamic, I think, built into journalism. Uh, what's different about Trump uh, and what our study shows is just how kind of extreme he is in this kind of business as usual model. Uh, so when he first started, uh, I think the press didn't quite take him seriously. And so the normal level of criticism that you would level at a, at, a, at a presidential candidate, someone you thought was going to be possibly the president of the United States, um, I think that guard was lowered a bit in Trump's case. Uh, and he was good for business. And uh, great stories were flowing out of Donald Trump. And uh, 
we did four studies during the election, and both during the pre-nomination period leading up to Iowa and New Hampshire, and during the nominating process itself, his coverage on balance was positive. Then when the competition goes away on the Republican side and we're down to the fact this man is going to be the presidential nominee, then the press got into its more normal mode where they were critical uh, of Donald Trump and, and looked at him through uh, a stricter uh, and, and more careful eye. And so he had pretty much negative coverage leading up uh, then through the election. But what's different about these 100 days uh, is that um, so again, Barack Obama is the exception of recent presidents. So in his first 100 days, he got more positive press than negative. Now, his second 100 days were negative. And in his second term, the first 100 days were <clears> negative. So he was an exception for a period, right? Uh, but for the others, uh, those first 100 days, uh, they've had more negative press than positive press. Bill Clinton kind of was at the extreme of that with 60, 40 uh, negative over positive. In our study of Donald Trump's first 100 days, it was 80-20. So that is an extreme version of what's normal, right? And uh, it's been kind of interesting, actually, the reaction to the study, right? Uh, you know, it's like most things today. I don't think people actually read these studies. They kind of cherry pick out of them what they like. And uh, unless they're like 14 words long. <laughs> right. 140 characters. 140 yeah. characters, yeah. You know, and for the, for the people who don't like Donald Trump, uh, the 80% negative means he deserved it. Uh, and for the people who like Donald Trump, the 80% negative means that the press is biased. So, uh, you know, we live in a polarized world and people kind of create these alternative realities and it's certainly happening around the study that we did. So we're using the term negative coverage, negative yeah. press, and I think it, it certainly is an accurate description, but is that a bad thing? Is that not sort of what the founders had in mind with the First Amendment? You know, they were rebelling against a king who deserved negative coverage, who deserved all kinds of critique. What's your assessment of that? Is that the role the press should be playing? Well, it's one of the roles that the press should be paying, playing. You know, we, we need the press to be vigilant. We need the press uh, acting in its watchdog role. Uh, it's not the only role, though, that the press plays. Uh, they're also in the business of informing us. And uh, if they're only informing us about what's going wrong and not also about what's going right, we're going to have a warped view of what politics and public affairs is all about. So I think they have a responsibility to tell us what's good as well as what's not so good about politics. Uh, but certainly in terms of kind of the incentives that journalists have, uh, you know, they don't get very much credit for the positive story. And you certainly don't win awards for the positive story. Uh, and uh, so I think there's a lot of pressure uh, on journalists to be critical. Uh, and if we had to make the choice, I think that's what we'd prefer, that they in fact act as, as that watchdog, as the fourth branch, as a check on those in power. But, uh, but for a public, uh, when they're stead of fed a steady by, uh, diet of negative coverage, and it's not just about presidents and Congress. Uh, you know, we looked, uh, for example, at the coverage of immigration over the last decade. Eighty percent of the stories about immigration have been negative in tone. Really? So immigration wow. kind of pops into the news when something goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, Muslims, uh, eighty percent of the coverage of Muslims, negative. The, rarely is there a positive story. Uh, about Muslims, and very seldom at all is a Muslim allowed to speak about Muslims. So in the Muslim coverage, only 3% of the sound bites are Muslims. I mean, it, they're almost a voiceless community as other people talk about them. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, during his first 100 days, uh, spoke seven times as much on television about Muslims as Muslims did about themselves, right? right. So, uh, so I, I just think it's a little bit out of balance. I, th I think the press has got to kind of move it back a little bit. And, uh, and the other thing is I think they have to be very careful and not see them, while they're in the watchdog role, not see themselves as somehow the opposition. Because the minute they start to see themselves as the opposition, then they start to selective, be very selective in what they're doing. And uh, we have an opposition in the American system, and that's the other political party. And uh, a watchdog is not an opposition group. It's someone who responds in this, by the same standards or applies the same standards 
to both political parties. Let me take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. An audio version of this program can be heard three times each weekend on Sirius XM's Politics of the United States channel. That's the POTUS channel, 124. We're produced each week in Providence by a tremendous team at Rhode Island PBS. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. You can tweet me at JM Lutis. My co-host is an award-winning journalist and author, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. You can tweet Wayne at G. Wayne Miller. And finally, our guest is Thomas E. Patterson, the Bradley Professor of Government and the Press at Harvard Kennedy School Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. And he tweets at Tom P. Harvard. So Tom, you said something that I want to follow up on here. Um, you, you talked about the, uh, uh, the, the media's tendency to report on the negative. Uh, and I know this is something that you've, you've, you've dedicated some, some scholarship to in the past. But you, you said the, the media needs to pull it back a little bit, find a little bit more balance. What's the incentive that they have? How do they do that? Is it simply a matter of editors demanding it, publishers saying you've got to do this? What, 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 what are the mechanisms that are going to drive that balance finally returning closer to center? Well, I think you have to change some of the incentives. Um, and... Um, and that takes a long time. I mean, so to, to change norms in any large institution uh, takes years. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about the development of objective journalism in the early 20th century, uh, which replaced the partisan journalism that existed before then, uh, that was roughly a 30 or 40 year transition before virtually all news organizations were engaged in kind of playing it down the middle in terms of the of the two political parties, emphasizing the facts rather than opinion. Uh, I, you know, and I do think, though, that, you know, so you, you've got to change the way that, that journalists kind of look out there and what they think news is, right? Uh, so if, if you look out there and all you're looking at is kind of looking for the mistake, right. you know, that's going to be the story, if you, if you kind of broaden that vision. Uh, but, you know, that changes, that requires a change in viewpoint, and we, do, we don't change our mind overnight, right, in that way. Same thing with uh, what's happening in colleges and universities, you know. I, we need to make some changes in the way we teach students today. Uh, but you've got people like me, right? I learned to do it a certain way. I've got, I, I've, I've got to do a little more learning. I, I've got to kind of broaden my perspective and understand the teaching role and how people learn in a somewhat different way. So I, I think that's fundamental. If we can't change the way journalists look at this situation, um, <clears throat> then it's not going to change. The other thing is if you can show that, in fact, there's an audience for that kind of journalism. Um, and there's a very interesting thing that's happening in Northern Europe. It started in Denmark, and it's now spread to three or four other countries where they're engaging in what they call constructive journalism. And, in fact, they're finding out that their audiences are increasing. And what they mean by constructive journalism is not lapdog journalism, not where they're you know, subservient to, to those in power. And it's not that you give up your watchdog role, but you kind of look out there and you also try to think about, okay, what's going well out there in society? What ought we to be seeing and thinking about? So, for instance, there was a story in the major, the leading Danish newspaper recently about, in Copenhagen, the lead was no bicycle deaths in five years, right? You're not going to find that kind of story in an American newspaper. Right. It's the opposite but, of, it, of if it bleeds, it leads. Right? It's yeah. the opposite of that. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it's sort of a traditional complaint you hear about the media. This goes back many yeah. years. Why is it always bad news yeah. as opposed to yeah. good news? This is a very interesting topic uh, because there are other factors at play here, too. In, in the American press, the for-profit press, we're, we're keeping out you know, PBS and, and, and public press, but in the for-profit press, the mainstream press, we have witnessed, certainly in print journalism, a great reduction in the workforce, which means the remaining, we've lost thousands of journalists in the last couple of decades. The remaining journalists are under great pressure to produce stories that are read. And we now have tools by which we can track, and I'm talking about all large and even small newspapers, track viewership, clicks, and so forth and so on. That translates into material you can take through your sales force to advertisers. This kind of story gets X number of clicks. We're pumping our numbers up. We're getting good numbers here. How, against all of those changing dynamics, do you change and become that more noble sort of newsroom that you're talking about? And I endorse it 
wholeheartedly, by the way, and, and there's a much longer discussion here, but right. you see mm -hmm. the two major factors, or among the two, that among the many that are at play here. What do you do about that? No, no, I, I think we're part of the problem. I mean, so that, you know, in some ways it's our preferences that are driving much of the content. In terms of we being consumers. We being consumers, consumers. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every time we go for the clickbait, yeah. you know, the, the salacious story or the whatever it is that's kind of trending at the moment, um, you know, that's going to affect decisions in the newsroom as to kind of what they're going to go after and how high they're going to post that one at the moment, but what they might do next yeah. as a follow-up, right? All and of and that is monitored very closely right. in yeah. newsrooms yeah. today, yeah. And minute by minute, really. And I think it's particularly um, uh, important in this era when, you know, a lot of newspapers particularly are under a lot of financial pressure. Uh, you're quite right, Wayne, uh, in terms of the attrition of, of journalists. And uh, I think we're down about a third, what we were even about two th year 2000. Uh, wow. And um, so a lot of newsrooms are understaffed, uh, so you end up doing the quick story, the easy story, uh, and then you do the trending story, right? And, uh, you know, and, and so I think to break that cycle, uh, I think there are some opportunities in this new media system that we're in uh, because there are a lot of niche audiences, right? And so there's also a lot of room for experimentation. Uh, and, uh, you know, outlets like Vice and Vox and so on, you know, they've kind of figured out a somewhat different model, and it may well be that that's the way that, in fact, some of this other kind of journalism will work its way into the media system. If it's successful here, then someone else may say, well, we want to do some of that too. So there's a lot of imitation in kind of any enterprise, uh, you know, whether it's public or private, and, uh, you know, we've seen it over the years in journalism, and I, I, I think it's probably likely that that will be the way that we'll get kind of the entering wedge on some of these problems. I also think another piece of this is the presentation, you know, the, the quality of the video that you're doing, the quality of the, the writing that you're doing. Pew has done a study that shows that some of the longer form narrative journalism on topics of importance actually have an audience. They get read. <clears throat> but it's because they're done elegantly and crafted and, and again that takes time and you don't have at every newspaper. Uh, the resources. The resources. Uh, um, so you, you've talked. We've talked a little bit today about the the need for the press not to see themselves as the opposition party to the to the president. Uh, but famously, early in his presidency, President Trump called the press the enemy of the American people. Uh, what are the risks of sort of sustained open warfare, for lack of a better word, <laughs> uh, between the president and the press? And it's not just one sided. No. It's not just the right. president, or it's not just the press throwing bombs. It's the president no. uh, returning no. fire. No. Well, I think in the long run, it's not good for either side, to be honest with you. And um, that's why I think the press really needs to avoid thinking of itself as somehow the opposition to the president. Uh, you know, we've got some very good studies about how people react to these kinds of messages. Uh, fake, the, you know, the press is involved in fake news, fake media. They hear that repeatedly, and actually it sticks with some people uh, mm. that... Uh, there's very good studies about what familiarity plays in our in our sense of what's believable and not believable. The more we hear something, even if it's not accurate, the more we're likely we are to believe it. Uh, and um, that's why I think in the long run it doesn't help the press to kind of get into all of these shouting matches with the president because it simply elevates that issue and raises questions in people's minds about whether in fact the press can be trusted. And then I don't think it's good for the president uh, to be in that in that situation either. Uh, you know, you look at the Gallup polls, uh, and this president's in the tank earlier than any president in the history of the Gallup polls, and uh, a lot of that is around trust. And uh, and ultimately, if you look at that office, the powers of the presidency, except in the area of war, are not all that impressive. Uh, they they lead by persuasion, by leadership. Uh, They've got to get Congress to agree, or they're never going to get programs through the Congress of the United States. And uh, that requires a measure of trust on the part of the Congress. And also, the more trust they have from the American people, the more Congress is inclined <laughs> to think, well, we better go along with the president on this. So I, I don't think it serves the president either. 25 years ago, you wrote a, a groundbreaking book, Out of Order, uh, about 
the the sort of the media pol political relationship in the, in the in the United States. And um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you about from that book was um, the sort of the contrast between uh, the role of the press and in an environment where now in 2017 these these journalist outlets are owned by entertainment companies and so you've got Les Moonves who boasts that you know Donald Trump might be bad for America but he's great for CBS all right, all right. Um, <laughs> what can what should citizens expect of journalists and journalism and the media in this environment and we've got about a minute yeah no, I think I think journalists need to do what they have done uh, since the early 1900s, and that's to insist as best they can uh, on a clear kind of wall of separation between the business side and the editorial and news side, uh, and they have to push hard on that, and that's really hard to do in today's environment. Look, when you're shedding jobs at the rate that journalism has been shedding jobs, I'm going to tell you, the line outside the door waiting to hold your job is a very long one. If mm -hmm. you push hard, too hard back at management, they'll take your job away. And, it, they, and they do, by and the way. And they do. So it's very difficult. But at some point, you know, I think that's the key. Journalists being journalists, sticking to their norms, sticking to their task, that's the key. That's a remarkable conversation, a hugely important issue. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, he's Tom Patterson. Uh, the study is news coverage of Donald Trump's first 100 days, and it's available on the Shorenstein Center's website uh, at harvard.edu. If you want to learn more about Story in the Public Square, please find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up with previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, hoping you'll join us again next week for more Story in the Public Square.